I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Imagine pulling a book from the shelf of a public library that has no checkout system, and all the books are chained to the stacks, just in case you happen to have sticky fingers. Public access to books in a public library, for instance, is more fraught than you might think. And a chained library established by the Englishman Francis Trigg is just one historical case in point. Free, yes, and public, yes, all the way back to its founding in 1598. But Mr. Trigg may as well have slapped chains on those words free and public. Now here's a little anonymous jingle inscribed in a book from that era. Steal not this book, my honest friend, for fear the gallows should be your end. And when you die, the Lord will say, and where's the book you stole away? The point here is that powerful people through the ages, usually wealthy people, the upper crust, they're the lucky ones who could really enjoy libraries and collections of magnificent art or cabinets of curiosities, galleries, museums. Free public libraries are a given today, but a relatively new thing when you think about it. An egalitarian spirit never really arrived at these places until around about the time that democracy began popping up generally in other human spheres. So in the meanwhile, books, exquisite art, antiquities, curiosities, for centuries these precious items were hands off for the unwashed, the unanointed, the plebs. I mean regular people like you and me. Today on the Constant Wonder podcast, wonder sometimes works its way into unexpected places, out of the way or improbable corners, locations that might otherwise be characterized by emptiness, blankness, the worst kind of vanilla-ness. I'm talking about those voids or gaps on our customary maps. Vacant niches, naked walls, backwoods, they can miraculously become avenues of discovery, but not until an animating spirit comes to dwell there. So let's get going with a guest by the name of Charlie Glenn, who has a story in this vein. Glenn is a writer of children's books who attributes her own turn toward the written word to the bookmobile, the mobile library that reached out into her own poor rural community, shaping and enlivening her youth when she was a young person in need of a larger world. My father had been killed in a mining accident when I was five years old. There were seven children in our family, and so we didn't have much money at all. So during the school year, I had a about an hour and a half to a two-hour bus ride to get to school because we had to wind through, you know, and stop at all the farms and pick up everyone. And I went to school in a, another tiny town called Mighton. And that was about 15 miles away from my home. And so during the summer, we really had no access to books, but for the few books that we owned. But every two weeks, the bookmobile brought the universe to me. Here I was, this little girl, no, no money for opportunities to travel or to do much of anything, but bookmobile came parked in front of R.G. Ross's farm every two weeks and we piled in the car. There was no limit on the number of books we could check out. We brought bushel baskets and we filled those baskets with books and they would last us until the next two weeks and then we would take them back and exchange them. Bushels and bushels of books and Charlie, the little girl, read everything the bookmobile could offer her. Little Women, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, Anne of Green Gables, Jane Eyre, Gone with the Wind. She also discovered biographies, Clara Barton, George Washington, Florence Nightingale. But where all this is leading for us right now isn't just a feel-good moment for that one little girl in rural America named Charlie, because that's just the backstory to the mature woman Charlie who years later stumbled across the origin story of the bookmobile. I told you Charlie is a children's book author, so having found out about this a few years back, she wrote an award-winning biography for young readers to tell the heroic tale of Mary Lemmis Titcomb. It's called Library on Wheels. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Charlie to talk about the contributions of this redoubtable librarian. And because the word redoubtable might not make it into many children's books, let's just say that 
Mary Lemus Titcom didn't win people over with charm. Now, I personally will not risk a stereotype here, but she has been described by one biographer as frosty in manner, prim, proper, pudgy, never seen on the street without white gloves and hat. Whatever cardboard cutout you might make for a staid adamantine librarian of that era, we're talking late 1900s and early 20th century, when it came to getting books out on the road, Titcomb was a trailblazer and pioneer. Unlike the influential steel magnate Andrew Carnegie with his philanthropic funding of public libraries, Titcomb was by no means aristocratic, much more boots on the ground. She launched her concept of books circulating by wagon in 1904, and in the first years, her book wagon averaged 30 miles a day, but speed really wasn't the goal. In fact, she stipulated that there was to be no hurrying from house to house. Driving the wagon was an erstwhile janitor named Joshua Thomas. Now, Thomas was a humble man, and he took to the project of getting books on wheels with a holy zeal. I read the book for the first time this morning, and there were a couple of quotes in it that I teared up on. Mm -hmm. And it's because um, because there is a quasi-religious aspect to this. One of the figures, and we'll get to him, Joshua Thomas, called himself yes. in, in the sense a book yes, missionary. I love that. A book missionary. I loved it. Yeah. And then there's this Nellie Christinger mm -hmm. who said, The library is my whole life, and the book wagon is the real joy in that life. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you why I cried. There were not puddles of tears, but I promise you I <laughs> teared up. They welled up in my eyes. Um, part of what we want to do on Constant Wonder on our show is call attention to the amazing simplicity of certain kinds of beauty. Mm. And something, few things are as simple as a wagon. Mm. And the ability of a wagon to bring something precious to somebody who needs it. And so the sense of a book missionary and the tool, as simple as a wagon, and the quotes from those two people, I was deeply moved. Let me tell you a little bit more about Joshua Thomas. He was the library janitor when Mary came up with this idea to outfit a horse-drawn wagon with shelves. She designed it. Not only did she have the idea, she designed it and presented it to the library board and was able to push through the skepticism and get it actually built. She designed this thing, but it was a horse-drawn wagon. In those days, this was 1905 when the bookmobile made its maiden voyage in rural Washington County, Maryland. It wouldn't have been appropriate for her as a woman alone to go out into the countryside driving the bookmobile. Plus, she had her duties as head librarian back at the county library. So they decided to employ the library janitor to drive the wagon. To drive the wagon. <laughs> and I, it was a perfect choice. Voice because Joshua Thomas was obviously a man who was very gregarious, who loved people, who loved children. He had been a veteran of the Civil War, and he was a native of Washington County. He wasn't a Yankee like Mary herself was, so he was trusted. After the Civil War, he had earned money by traveling throughout the county and gathering produce and dairy products and taking it back into Hagerstown, the county seat, to sell at market. So the people living in the outlying areas, even in the remote farms up in the Appalachian foothills, knew him, trusted him. So they employed him. He knew the roads, he knew the people, and he obviously relished his role. And I loved when I found that entry in the census report where he had self-reported his occupation as book missionary. Oh, and you just mentioned something we have to go back to. The novelty of this idea, it was a radical yeah. idea. Yeah. And Mary Lemist Titcomb seems to have been the kind of person who persevered with yes. her ideas no matter who would be a naysayer. Right. This was, this was how far-fetched was this? Pretty far-fetched at this time. The whole library movement was fairly new in America and was pretty much limited to New England. The idea of a public lending library. 
Because the philosophy that Mary had that drove her throughout her entire life was this democratic idea that books were for everyone. Because up until then, books were for the rich. There were private libraries. Books were for men. Books were for adults. And she said, no, books are for everyone, for the poor people, for the country dwellers, for the farmers, for women, for children, for girls. There's a quote that I lifted right out of your book where she had described the library as an edu... Actually, about the bookmobile. It at once established itself as an education recreational and democratizing influence mm -hmm. in the community, bringing all classes of people to Yes, it. yes. All she classes. loved to tell stories because she became an advocate for what she called the rural distribution of books. It involved more than just the bookmobile. The bookmobile or the book wagon, as it was called then, was sort of the culmination of a series of steps that she took once she came from New England to oversee this county library. One story she told was a, of a young man who came when the book wagon returned, but he said, do you have anything else by that guy Shakespeare? I really <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, she absolutely saw this. And literacy rates in Washington County rose as a result of this. There, the, there were a lot of people that couldn't read that lived up in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. So the bookmobile that she conceived was a place where it, you check out the books right there. But it had a secondary function of delivering also supplies of books to these mm -hmm. little regional boxes. Right. What do they call those? Deep right. depots? The book or deposit de stations. A book she deposit station. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that was the precursor to the mobile, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the very first thing she did when she came to this little county was she set aside a separate room in the library just for children. That was a revolutionary thing. It was one of the very first children's libraries in the nation. I think the New York City Public Library had the first. And then she started story hours out in the country. I found some fabulous old photographs of children arriving on ponies and on bicycles. And it looks like they're just seated out in the middle of a field, one of the librarians reading stories to children. They also made sure that all of the outlying village schools had a rotating supply of books and images, pictures. And then she set up what she called book deposit stations. And they were just little boxes that would hold maybe 30 to 40 books. And they would be in county stores or mills or creameries or toll booths, sometimes homes. And they served as many like branch libraries where people could go and check out books and return them. And then every few weeks or every couple of months, a new supply would be brought in. And the setbacks that she had. The big one was the railroad accident. Yes. So the maiden voyage of the book wagon was in 1905. And Joshua Thomas, again, was the book missionary overseeing the book wagon. And it was very successful for five years. And then one day on his way back to Hagerstown, I'm not sure what the circumstances were, but he was crossing a rail track and didn't hear an oncoming train. Thankfully, he and the horses had passed over the track, but the train hit the book wagon. The book wagon was destroyed and all of the books were destroyed. A little footnote for you here. No people nor horses were injured in the production of this podcast, nor in the writing of Charlie's book, presumably. Mr. Thomas himself escaped with just a few injuries. So it looked like maybe that was going to be the end of this grand experience. But Mary Lemus Titcom said, uh uh, no, we're pressing forward. She had hard evidence to show how effective it had been, how the rates of literacy had risen. And so she had to go back to the library board and fight hard. And there wasn't money. And it, th this was the time that the horseless carriage start, you know, was a thing. And they were pretty expensive. And there was one member of the library board who had seen what Mary had been able to do from the beginning. When she had something in mind, she made sure it happened. And he was able to come forward with enough money to buy another uh, the second book wagon, which was a motorized international harvester. In 1912, the replacement wagon was ready for use. The horsepower now, no longer horses. I confess I had to go online 
to look up a 1912 International Harvester just to get some sense for what this classic automobile looked like. But folks back then still called it the book wagon. And in the community there in Washington County, in spite of the mishap on the rails, the concept of a mobile library had come to stay. And decades later, Mary Lemmis Titcomb's undeterred legacy would factor into the life of a young Charlie Glenn in a far distant but equally poor, rural, neglected corner of America's Intermountain West. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is the Constant Wonder Podcast. The full title of Charlie Glenn's book is Library on Wheels, Mary Lemmis Titcomb and America's First Bookmobile. If you think taking a library on the road is a challenge, let's talk museums. I should mention again, we're reflecting on unexpected wonders of the kind that pop up in some neglected or unlikely place. Charles Phillip is the co-creator of a small nonprofit that installs temporary museums about the size of vending machines in busy but empty places like the corner of a hospital waiting room. These miniature museums have multiple compartments instead of separate rooms for displays. Charles Phillips grew up in London. It's a place not really hurting badly for museums at all. London, you know, it's a magnet to the whole world for its museums alone. And in childhood, Charles assumed everybody else must surely have easy access to museums. After all, he did. There came a day when Charles Philip and his partner and co-creator Amanda Shockett were sitting in a bland, mind-numbingly bland waiting room. Waiting rooms are orphans that even architects seem to care little about. Well, anyway, perhaps Charles and Amanda just couldn't take the stifling blandness anymore, or, or maybe an actual muse descended upon them and told them to start resurrecting dead spaces like this one with some more lively idea than, oh, plastic potted plants. They would design and produce micro-museums to put in just such improbable places. Their brainchild ultimately came to be known as micro, no doubt because a micro-museum is much too small for anybody to tack on a facade with giant Greco-Roman marble columns. Micro's mini and mobile museum installations are akin to bookmobiles. The common denominator here, I think, is meeting people where they are. And that's no mere figure of speech. A micro-museum can engage an audience even before that audience thinks to engage with the museum. Just skip all the advanced planning. Let the magic just come to you. You don't make the pilgrimage. You don't travel a great distance or buy tickets or walk up all those formal stairs leading to a traditional temple of wisdom and knowledge. Micro-museums, they're, they're not big. So our museums really try to change that. We try to include as many people as possible in these essential conversations because the issues that are sort of plaguing humanity right now, a lot of them require a really engaged population. We need to rethink how some of these institutions work to fulfill that promise. Our museums, 90% of the visitors are non-white. We are the first and only science museum in the Bronx. There are sort of all these depressing accolades that show how much people want this but have traditionally not felt welcomed. Now, you could always say that the problem of disseminating information as far as the streets, that's been eased by the Internet, but it's still a challenge to do it. And these days, the biggest challenge may not be just delivering information to people where they are, but inviting them to fully engage with that information, encouraging them to stand up, move their bodies, crane their necks, even get down on their hands and knees to better understand, oh, let's just say, the way the world is for a mollusk, which was the subject of Micro's first batch of Micro Museums. Content warning here, this is going to get a little bit slimy. Mollusks are these alien-like creatures. They are tentacled. They, they have blue blood. They breathe through their skin. Some have no brains. So they are really as different from us as we can possibly fathom. And the first exhibit on the museum is actually these B-movies. I spent hours and hours just watching B-movies from the 70s and 80s of these <laughs> you know, alien creatures that are, are slimy and tentacled and all based upon mollusks.
It might help to clarify here, just because our podcast has showcased bees and wasps in the previous episode, but Charles isn't talking about flying insects. You know, he's talking bee movies, the ones made cheaply as quick fodder for theaters. This all started back around the 1950s. The bee movies were the bottom half of a double feature, and a whole lot of them happened to be sci-fi alien movies with the aliens modeled in many instances after mollusks. So the opening exhibit is this little sculpture of two humans watching these bee movies of these terrifying creatures doing terrifying things to the earth, you know, covering their eyes. We start saying, you know, they are as different from us as we can fathom. And we ask the question, who is new to the planet? Who is the alien here? And the last exhibit on the museum is actually mollusks sitting in the theater chairs watching nature documentaries of what <laughs> humans have done to the planet. And it flips the script a little bit. Maybe humans are the aliens here. So in the middle of that narrative arc, we really wanted to have people understand otherness. You know, a natural history museum is a powerful thing, but, you know, just looking at history doesn't make it necessarily relevant to people's daily lives. And because we're putting these museums in laundromats and DMVs and public libraries and hospitals, we aren't appealing to a self-selecting audience. Um, we aren't, people aren't traveling to these museums. We're giving them this moment of curiosity in their daily life. And as a result, we really have to make sure that the content is relevant and people feel and understand it in a way that can, can change the way that they view their daily life and perhaps change their behavior. Do you see the ambush going on here, the surprise factor? It goes kind of like this. I walk into the DMV, I get in line, it's moving at a snail's pace, and with no warning at all, suddenly I'm standing in front of a micro-museum that showcases these humble creatures known as mollusks. And instead of languishing away in boredom, I might just suddenly think, I do have time to think and care about mollusks, no matter how slimy. And if in this unexpected encounter, what I learn about gastropods, cephalopods, bivalves, if any of this in any way pivots me toward empathy. Well, Charles Philip actually thinks that's precisely what could happen, and he makes no bones about it. Empathy for the other was really what this museum is about, because that's relevant to anyone, whether you know what a mollusk is or not. So in the middle of this museum is this acrylic box that is half the size of a shoebox. On the back wall of it is a graphic of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, and then there's a liter of slime uh, inside of this acrylic box. And then underneath the Brooklyn Bridge, it says, this is the amount of slime a snail would need to go from one side of the Brooklyn Bridge to the other. Slime is the least energy effective mode of transportation in the animal kingdom. My co-founder uh, of Micro, Amanda Shockett, she did a lot of calculations to try to figure out how much slime it would take. There weren't any academic studies on this, but it would take one liter of slime and it would take about 10 days for the snail to go from one side to the other. So it, we really want people to walk in the snail's shoes. We wanted to give them this empathy experience of understanding what life might be like uh, to be a mollusk. Because if you can bridge that gap from human to mollusk, then you can do it with your neighbor so much easier. This is fascinating to me. You imagined, and Amanda, working together, you imagined transit across the Brooklyn Bridge if you were a snail. And you knew that the mode of transportation is scooting along on top of slime you have to produce yourself to do that. Mm -hmm. And you thought... We'll quantify that, and then we'll tell people about it. That's what you did? Yeah, that's exactly what we did. What we had to do is figure out how many microns thick a slime trail is, and then we had to figure out there are different modes that a snail can transport under. And in order to, to save slime, it can actually do this thing. I think it's called LARPing, where it wiggles back and forth and sort of skates on the slime rather than using the entire undersurface, and it can do that to preserve water or to try to not leave as much of a chemical scent trail if it's being predated. And we had to figure out how snails, on average, walk with their one foot. 
it was a fascinating uh, experience. We had to work with snail researchers from across the world. I have to, do have to say, snail researchers take that role very seriously, did not quite understand the questions that we were asking. They were not as forthright with, with answers as we imagined. They did not quite understand why we were trying to communicate to the general public how much slime a snail would need for, for its commute. Isn't there something in that that that's the kind of question the kid would ask? Yeah, totally. And I think that's one of the things that science communicators could benefit from the most. A, a lot of scientists spend their days answering extremely specific questions. And as a result, they've developed this extremely specific vocabulary because specificity in science is incredibly important. They end up working tirelessly on papers that are read by their peers and maybe a couple of the general public, but probably not. And I think that there's this beauty to broadening those conversations and figuring out how to engage the general public. And sometimes that's just asking naive questions. At Micro, we've termed this structured curiosity. How do you encourage people to ask better questions and then seek the answers in a way that is somewhat validated? How do you seek quality answers? And it just starts by asking questions, as many questions as you can, you know, and not being worried about them being dumb. Because the important thing is that you are interrogating the world. And I am a firm believer that if you scratch the surface of anything, there is a vast story there. And sometimes it just means being brave enough to ask those questions in the first place. Part of my job is interrogation, and I have some dumb questions to ask still. And so I'm, I'm going to ask, number one, are you assuming a snail on a hot day in Brooklyn? Uh, are, are, number two, are, are you assuming, I'm going to mix my metaphors and my species here, are you assuming the snail can take a beeline to get across the bridge? Is it a straight line? We did assume that it was traveling in a pretty straight line. And if you've ever gone across the Brooklyn Bridge, I can assure you that it is almost impossible with the number of cyclists and joggers and people taking photographs to travel in a straight line. So you might be right, actually. Maybe we should revisit this. If you want to <laughs> spend a couple of hours doing calculations with me, we can definitely update the museum. Before I go swimming, I test the waters with my toe. I'm wondering if a snail tests the temperature of the pavement before heading out. Yeah, I'm... A human. We, you and I have video here, so that makes it a, a little easier to tell. But I am a human. You know, like I have this, you know, giant organ on the outside of my body, the, my skin, that covers every inch of me other than a couple of holes in my face. And elsewhere, I am largely impermeable. A snail is just like the boundary between the outside and the inside is utterly permeable. They often breathe through their skin. They sort of ooze chemicals and the way that they engage with the world just must be fascinating. They have chemoreceptors covering the bottom of their foot, so they taste every surface that they crawl across. How would riding the subway as a snail be? It's just endlessly interesting to put yourself into that place of being this like both extremely vulnerable through not really having a boundary, but carrying your shell on your back and having this fortress that you can retreat into. So so what does it do for you once you have made this extensive comparison? Or you invite a child to think about a snail going, uh, there's an ick factor in here too. We got to say that little container of slime. I, 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 there must be some disclaimer that no snails were harmed in the no uh, snails collection of this slime the, or whatever production of this yeah i mean they they do they they use snail slime in cosmetics there's videos of the collection process it's it, it is truly a, a little bit horrific they put these thousands and thousands of snails inside a mesh bag and then just shake them and they all get scared and start to ooze. And then they sort of wring out this bag. And then they put that in face creams. We wouldn't have been the first people to milk slime from a snail. We do use a, a resin instead. We've avoided the worst of the, of the accusations, I think. 
but yeah, what, what, do you, <laughs> what do you do? Um, I think that that's part of it. The ick factor, there is something to positive friction, making somebody just stop or slow down a little bit. And it doesn't need to be positive. You can use ick to teach people a lot. The important thing is getting people out of their comfort zone a little bit. And that can be done with positive reinforcement or positive friction. And by playing into that, that ickiness, one of my favorite things that happened at the museum was at this community center in the Lower East Side. It's an after-school program for girls. And it's quite a fantastic organization called the Lower East Side Girls Club. And they uh, got all the girls together and it was an art class, which, you know, like they just were going to paint pictures of squid. But how they did it even blew me away. Next to the museum, they did a squid dissection and then took the ink out of the squid and then used that to paint squid. It just seems like the sort of thing that you remember for the rest of your life. They will have this embedded memory of working with this mollusk that they might just find in a dinner dish other than this. And it really changes your perspective on things. Can I talk perpetual motion with you? Yeah, let's do it. You and okay. the rest of the world. The number of emails that I get that are like, <laughs> I hear you made a museum about perpetual motion machines. Have Now, I know that normally they don't work, but I have a design <laughs> that will blow you away. <laughs> and then they always offer a price for to buy their designs. Most people in our modern times are in perpetual motion themselves. Mm. They never stop. Mm. And if I'm going from home to my place of work, and if I'm taking the subway or if I'm in a car, I'm moving, 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 then suddenly along my way, when I have a destination and I've got to get there, I go through some lobby somewhere or a subway platform and there's a little museum and I do a double take and it stops me in my track and my motion ceases. Your perpetual motion museum is meant to arrest people. Yeah, it is. I'll describe the museum a little bit. In the base of it is this spinning sculpture that has a strobe light flashing on it. It's called a zoetrope. It gives the illusion that these characters inside of the sculpture are actually moving and the whole museum is a little bit more frenetic. It has marble runs on it with designs for perpetual motion machines. It has a spinning disc in the base. It has infrared cameras so you can see your body and the heat actively escaping. And the entire thing is essentially about how hard it is to capture and store energy. And the human story is very much about, you know, you only get so much energy you know, don't waste it. <laughs> we do that through showing all of these inventors who have, you know, lost fortunes and, and given up large swaths of their lives trying to break the laws of physics, you know, which uh, is an interesting pursuit, but it is unfortunately impossible. We really wanted to, people to sort of see themselves in a way as a machine. You have a certain amount of efficiency. You know, 30% of your calories are used to power your brain. There's different ways to think in, uh, in a slightly mechanistic way about your body and um, the amount of energy that you have uh, and really encouraging people to think about that and, and to use themselves and their energy wisely. The unexpectedness of the placement of the museum seems to be part of the, the recipe here. Very much so. It's a strange thing to create something that hasn't existed before. We really like to just give people this opportunity to discover something. And discovery is so important to learning. This sense of awe, this friction that sort of slows you down and stops you a little bit because we all operate a little bit in the default mode network. And to take people and show them something new is really powerful kids because they're just so open and, and excited and they're in this perpetual state of discovery they find it and they're just like whoa what is this thing and you know they aren't suspicious at all they really just hug it and get absorbed in it you know then the caretaker might be checking their phone in some ways micro is competing against candy crush we sit down we take out our phone 
And especially if you're in these sort of strange in-between spaces where you're prone to be bored. And really, it's this amazing opportunity to discover the edges of the universe and the beginning of life on Earth. The way that we want to engage with this is to sort of show people that every moment is a valuable moment where you can expand your horizons. I'm going to reach for your inner poet now and try to pull that out because you have described these museums as a bit of a portal, and that's a metaphor. What would your inner poet say the possibilities are of going through a portal like this? I mean, I guess there's a sci-fi component to the word <laughs> portal too. Yeah, I sort of think back to the origins of museums. The British Museum and the Louvre all started as cabinets of curiosity. And cabinets of curiosity started to spring up in Europe because people were going to the unknown. Shipping was increasing and trade was increasing and, and all of these oddities started showing up and then people started telling stories about where they came from and, and they all started with questions. You know, what, what is that? Like, it, it, it's a hippo tooth. What is a hippo? What could the rest of that animal possibly look like if that's what its tooth looks like? And stories started to emerge, and they weren't all factual, but they all were born from these beautiful questions. You know, museums can often lead with answers. And I think that there's this great opportunity to lead with questions. I think it is humbling. It puts you in a position of curiosity, and it really opens you up and allows you to be vulnerable enough to pursue the unknown and to break free from the, the shackles of, of default world. We're going to turn next to yet another unexpected and uplifting use of neglected spaces. When's the last time you got to meet a professional mosaicist? That's right, mosaicist. My guess is that this is a rare species of human, we're going to be hearing from one about an enduring public art form that goes back for centuries. And recently, across the pond in England, it's proven to have therapeutic potential in the realm of mental health care. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Tessa Hunkin is far more likely than most who call themselves artists to succeed in leaving an indelible mark on the world at least in part because of her medium. Tile is durable. Tiles set in the right space with the right kind of mortar can endure for eons. Now think back on our previous two stories this hour. Both the Bookmobile and the Mobile Micro Museum speak to our hunger for discovery and learning, but they do it with an element of surprise by leaving traditional brick-and-mortar walls behind and inhabiting unexpected spaces. It might help for me to reiterate that in this episode of the Constant Wonder podcast, the red thread touches on that momentary and very pleasant disorientation of fresh thinking that can happen when we cross paths with a little museum or, or, or books that break their chains and they seek us out where we are. Or, as in this next story, when we find ourselves one day strolling along somewhat aimlessly through a public park or along a street out under the open sky, and we are met by a striking image made out of simple tiles. The image catches our eye. It says, here I am. See me. I'm here for seeing. Come meet me. Mosaic can certainly be installed in some interior or conventional space, public or private, but as we visit with Tessa Hunkin, a British professional mosaicist, I'm going to invite you to think a little bit about the startle you may have felt when stumbling across this kind of art, situated perhaps in the open, in some otherwise forgotten corner or byway, some spot you could utterly forget and disregard were it not for this intentionality made visual, tactile, and solid. Tessa used to work on upper crust commissions, you could say, corporate or private, creating beautiful works, of course, but let's also say works that very few of us would likely ever see. 
Now she's working more in a different vein, creating beautiful art for public spaces, and she's doing it with the help of individuals, adults, who struggle with addiction or mental illness. It's all happening in the London area, and it's bringing creative purpose and expression to souls looking for some kind of therapy or healing influence. She and I began our conversation with an exchange about a mosaic she helped create called The Hounds of Hackney Downs. I don't know why I'm thinking about Sherlock Holmes now, a hound of the Baskervilles. These Hackney Downs dogs are whimsical, spirited representations, a merry mosaic, a mural, if you will, of the scientific species known as Canis familiaris. I'll translate that for you, man's best friend. The mosaic features actual portraits of specific dogs that have frequented the park. Each dog with his or her name above the portrait and there's a link here, a kind of shout-out to the ancient Roman mosaic tradition that Tessa draws inspiration from. It came about completely by accident, but I would say is possibly the most successful community project anybody could ever think of. It happened because we have a fantastic studio in the middle of a park in Hackney in London. I get to walk through the park on my way to the, the studio, to the sessions with my group, and I loved watching the dogs running across. It's quite a big open space and they would get up some speed. It was a beautiful image. And then I was looking for something for my group to do because I have to keep them busy because that's the whole point. They like to be busy. And there was this blank wall in the park and I thought, well, I'll do some running dogs on the blank wall. So that's what I started doing. And then one of my group said, actually, that dog looks a bit like my dog can I put my dog's name over it? And I suddenly thought, yes, of course, because a lot of Roman mosaics feature the names of dogs because hunting dogs were enormously prized by the Romans, as they should be. So one or two names crept in that way. And then other people kept saying, but what about my dog? Why isn't my dog there? And I thought, well, I can't do them all running along. There isn't room. And we started just doing portraits, just the faces of the dogs. And the demand was just incredible. I mean, everybody who had a dog in that park would come and visit us and they would bring their dogs with them. And this was fantastic for the group because it meant that we were really embedded in the community. The community loved us. We loved them. Well, particularly we loved the dogs um, and the dogs. And so we made so many new friends and we've had some fantastic events. There are now nearly 100 dogs on the wall. And at various occasions, we've had opening parties to which we invited all the dogs. And trying to get the group photo was, was pretty good fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to tell you, there's some beautiful something or other going on here in terms of a community space and a, a gathering, a central focus for the community of something they love. And then I'm just stunned to think that there's a connection where Romans would make mosaics of their dogs with their names? <laughs> yep. The Romans were quite important to this project. When I was trying to think of how to do a community mosaic, I'm a professional mosaicist. I'm a bit kind of arrogant, probably, and I have high standards. And and I never really liked community mosaic. I always thought it was rather letting the side down and giving mosaics a bad reputation. And I thought, well, if, there must be a better way. And it was the Romans who gave me the idea, really. They made very large mosaics, as you know, but obviously they were made by lots of different people. You know, it wasn't the work of a single creative artist. And so they had a kind of system of how to lay mosaic and how to render things quite simply and dramatically in mosaic. Um, and some of the Roman mosaics, the ones that I particularly like, are very dynamic as well. They have a lot of movement in them, so they really appeal to me. But what it occurred to me was that, that if you could use that style that the Romans had developed, it answered lots of questions about how to lay mosaic. And, and you could do this with a group of lots of different people because it would give a kind of coherence to the way they worked. And so what you would end up with would not just be, well, a dog's dinner, but something that was both lovely to look at and had been fun to make. That's kind of how it started. It's branched out a bit since then. We do all kinds of other things. But the Romans were very <laughs> influential on me to get the whole thing off the ground in the first place. When did the idea occur to you to enlist volunteers to work with you? And from which community did you decide to draw for those volunteers and why? 
There was a group who used to come and visit our commercial studio where we had a shop and they were a group who were in recovery from mental health problems. And they were always so enthusiastic about what we were doing and they wanted to come and see the commissions we were working on. And, you know, they said, can't we come and help? Please let us help. I was very tempted by that idea, but because it was a kind of commercial situation and we had rather grand clients and things, I couldn't quite think how, how to make that work. But um, that was where the seed was planted in my mind. And I did quite a bit of work with that group in the mental health world. So I got a bit of experience with that. And then I wanted to do something a bit more ambitious. I wanted with them to make larger things because I felt it was good for self-esteem and for sort of bringing them back out into the community. You know, if you have a project that's just kind of focused on what people's problems are, you're kind of rubbing their noses in it slightly. But if you have a project that's a way of reintegrating them or at least making some contact with, with the outer world, I thought that in itself might be helpful for people. Uh, some of your mosaic work has been installed. It's very clear to me that the intention with this art is to celebrate this hyper-local place. And, and the Shepherdess Walk area, from what I've gathered, it has a history. Well, you can guess that just from its name handed down from a time that was far less urban long ago. It's kind of a recycled place and a neglected history there. No sheep anymore, no shepherdesses, except as memorialized in your mosaic, along with, and this is a very delightful surprise to see, some contemporary objects in the mosaics like a frisbee. and <laughs> A frisbee, and that made me laugh because it seems, you know, so mundane, so uh, commonplace. That was indeed part of the original idea. There are some Roman mosaics in North Africa which have survived terrifically well because of the climate there. But they, they're also very, very beautiful and they had a lot of different coloured stones and so they're very lively and very lovely colours. I was fascinated to find that archaeologists find them really useful because they record details of everyday life and so there was a lot of there's a lot of Roman literature, but it doesn't necessarily write about the kind of farming tools that they use. Very kind of practical things which you can convey in a picture. I thought that was rather magical, really, and so I that was part of the inspiration for Shepherdess Walk was that in we could embed in the mosaics little references to modern life, so that in two thousand years when people look at them, they will find out what kind of things we were doing. So there's a petrol engine leaf blower. There are some mobile phones. And in, in fact, already one of the mobile phones has a little kind of knob on the top, like a little aerial. And some of the early mobile phones have these little things. And that's what I showed in the mosaic. And so already it's commemorating something that we've <laughs> forgotten about. Well, to, but to the forgotten people, I think oftentimes, for example, there is a, a beautiful mosaic at St. Anne's Hospital. It took about 14 weeks to, to put together, and the artists there, as I understand, were, were people in the psychiatric ward. Yeah, that was a fascinating experience. One of the things that I liked about that project was that I brought some of my team from Hackney Downs, they came and helped. Another Im important thing that you can do is if you're focused on an activity rather than your particular problems, you get to meet pro people with other problems. And in this case, my team met people with problems that were much more serious and much more severe. They were actually incarcerated. They were on a lot war with the people we were working with. And I think that was a very profound experience for all of us, seeing what their lives were like and trying to bring them something something colourful and different into their difficult lives. I'm very interested in the longevity of a mosaic. We can reach back in time. You've been to Jordan. Uh, what did you find in Jordan that fed you in some manner? Um, well, the mosaics of Jordan are, are I think, perhaps my favourites in the world. Oh, I don't know. I have so many favourite mosaics, but they were particularly inspiring for me. They're very late, late Roman, early Byzantine, sort of early Christian. So they come at the end of hundreds of years of mosaic making, by which time it has been distilled into this very stylized repertoire of how to convey figures and animals and trees that's quite simplified. None of that sort of incredibly fine detail that you get in the Pompeii mosaics, but nonetheless 
filled with vitality. I suppose they're a bit like cartoons. And there's something magical about being able to convey something as complicated as character or emotion or movement in as, as economically as possible. The mosaics of Jordan have this very good language, but I find them very, very lively. Looking at them, I thought, yes, my team can do this. The second big project we got after Shepherdess Walk was for a children's playground. And I thought, yes, now we can do some wild animals. We can do the kind of animals that don't roam in Hackney um, because small children will be interested in that. Have you seen small children responding to that particular mosaic? Yes, it's so sweet. They stroke the animals, they go up to them, and I've seen them, you know, stroking them. So, yeah, it's always, it's always a very moving sight. And, and a lot of parents have, have told me, you know, that they've taught their children, because they, all the animals have their names, you know, the names of the animals written in mosaic above them, again, like the hunting dogs, but yeah. And all these little children in Hackney have learned the names of the animals from the mosaic. And this means that they've also uh, learned the name of the Okapi, which is a very un-Roman animal. They never appeared in the Roman mosaic, but it just happens to be one of my favourite um, animals, so I put it in the mosaic. And now there's a whole generation of children who know, uh, know the name and will recognise the Okapi. Let me be Google for you here. If you just can't picture an Okapi right off the top of your head, O-K-A-P-I, Okapi. It's kind of a mostly chestnut brown horsey thingy, I'm going to say. Stockier, has white cheeks, white snout, uh, a white zebra stripey forelegs and back haunches and legs. It is a true wonder to behold the Okapi, as are the images produced in mosaics by the Hackney Mosaic Project. Plants and animals and trees and people all seasons of the year and, of course, dogs with their given names. Thanks for joining with us for this episode of Constant Wonder. We hope you've enjoyed our visit with author Charlie Glenn, micro-museumist Charles Phillip, and mosaicist Tessa Hunkin. For me, it's always a reward to, to reflect on the spaces that surround us and to feel surprisingly accessible wonder there, oftentimes overlooked in the in-between places. This episode of Constant Wonder was produced by Eric Schultzka with Anya Searle and sound designed by Addy Mangum and Kevin West. A quick heads up for you right now. This episode concludes season two for us. We're going to take a four-week hiatus to line up more episodes for you. And we'll see you back here the first week of January. Until then, dip into our archives. It's all free for the listening. There's probably some episodes you missed in season two, and there's some incredible stuff in season one as well. I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.